Hi, my name is Kit. I'm diagnosed as being neurodiverse and I work with other neurodiverse people using an approach based on design thinking. And I'm going to talk to you about this for the next 13 to 15 minutes or so. It starts from a point of collaboration, which is one of the key tenets of design thinking. And it also involves other things such as wicked problems and positive deviance and other models that I've come across in my studies that I think make this a really functional way of working with neurodiversity. I have a background in the arts, teaching and community work with an interest in design and in ethnography. So that's me. All of this happened while I was in recovery from significant burnout and I was told to do things that I love and what I love is learning. While I was walking through series of design principles, some light bulbs started to go off and I'd really like to share some of those with you now. So let's dive in. A wicked problem is a social or cultural problem that is difficult to solve because of its complex and interconnected nature. A good example would be homelessness or the current situation with the environment. One of the hallmarks of a wicked problem is there's no way of knowing if a solution is final. One of the reasons being that society is constantly evolving. Design thinking starts with empathy and reframes the problem at hand. It initially employs divergent thinking, which is getting lots of ideas, before later distilling down to a couple of ideas, convergent thinking, to prototype and test. This is widely used in the user design field, and this is the approach to build apps, products, and services. Finally, positive deviance was used as an approach to improve child malnutrition in Vietnam. Those who worked on this initiative started from a point of view that somewhere in the community, there were healthy children. And I encourage you to have a little look on the internet because this is a really fascinating way of working with people. Okay, on this slide, I'm going to try to present how neurodiversity is a wicked problem. So if we look at the lists that I've presented here in the scheme of comorbidities and phenomena that are specific to neurodiversity, it's pretty clear that there is no one solution to this. To help things along, the condition comes with sabotage built in via pathological demand avoidance and oppositional defiance disorder that you can set off within yourself just by making a list. In recent days, there's been a medication shortage due to the surge in diagnoses. And those that have received a late diagnosis are likely to be in burnout to the point of skill regression and not know. There are comorbidities like gut health and obesity, restless leg, dental issues, excessive cortisol, which is the stress hormone, and crippling migraines. Some of these are caused by inconsistent self-care. Growing up without diagnosis brings complex trauma to the near incessant negative feedback a person will receive. Even after diagnosis, a person will spend years growing out of internalized ableism. These folk may become isolated or at best withdraw. Neurodiverse people are vulnerable to substance and process addictions, both which need an income to sustain. Consistent income for some is hard, travelling through many jobs and differing industries. Poor social networks mean the problems go on longer than they should, and negative self-beliefs are reinforced. Hours of doom scrolling and shopping, which is what I mean by process addictions, narrow the view of a neurodiverse person who will then become more and more dissociated, which in turn negate an effective recovery from burnout. Social media is now beginning to make a cookie cutter of neurodiversity and the community has turned in on itself, demanding authentic presentation 
with high functioning squaring off against high needs. There is something really interesting about neurodiversity now in 2024. As many of you will know, late diagnosis or presentation within adults is something that is as recent as 10 years old. So what that means is that for the first time, lived experience is actually leveling up next to research and healthcare. But what does that mean then for design thinking? Okay, the diagram that I've shown here is like an umbrella representation of design thinking. There's at least 10 other models out there that I know of, some of which are specific to societal problems, some are more straightforward and concerned with product development and getting to testing, and some are more complex. Now, I just want to remind you, going back a couple of slides, the definition there was that it's iterative and non-linear. So any of these steps can occur and reoccur over a period of time. What I would like to remind you is it really does rely on persistence, reflection, and collaboration. So this means a person can go backwards and forwards as they gather knowledge or gain insight. It's focused on what will work, how things can improve, and all ideas are good ideas until it needs boiling down to things to test out. There is very little analysis involved in this. This is all about staying in the present. There are often opportunities to identify with other people in the community and build bonds based on identification. So transferring this model here from a product to a person, what I've noticed is that my clients have needed to almost self empathize as they understand what are behaviors that are socialized, that were neurotypical expectations, or were assumptions of themselves that they just didn't deserve. Hopefully, one of the things that you will have observed in this model is that it is about generating ideas with a lot of permission to try things and especially to make mistakes. Okay. So what you see on this slide is how the model is modulated to work with individuals who are neurodiverse. I think it works because it relies on the love of knowledge, the willingness to go down rabbit holes and just general curiosity, which I think are some of the strengths of being neurodiverse. Uh, the model itself relies on having a beginner's mindset. This teaches skills like pragmatic observation, noting, and it's a safe platform to understand things like interoception and proprioception and other things associated with neuroscience that are not the person, but their brain function. It mobilizes pattern recognition. As all the facts start to come in, a person will invariably notice what is working and what's not working. The good stuff is that they can see results straight away. One of my clients batch cooked for the first time and marveled at turning up for work on time every day that week. I think mostly the intention is to give a framework that's time bound and offers a method to digest the overwhelming amount of information that you find once you connect with being a neurodiverse person. It surfaces some good stuff that people are doing to get them through the day. And my favorite is watching people realize that they may have been already using some of these strengths without noticing it and the persistence that they've had to get through every day. That's kind of how I felt when I got diagnosed. And it's lovely to see that realization for other people. The end point, the tool to understand better needs is a document. It's like a manual of me. And this will outline what they look like when they're on form, what they look like when they're burnt out, 
what they need at home and what they need at work. It also has a signposting so that they can get more support if they need it or if anybody else, if a friend, a family member or a colleague has access to that document, it tells them where they can get help. I think the existence of this is really quite grounding to see having people work through gathered information, understand what's them, understand what's their brain, begin to really, really understand that life can be so much easier for them, that they can be curious, that they can be safe, and they can live every day like it's their first. Something that is worth noting before I finish is that this involves lots and lots of approaches and techniques. There's a little bit of Buddhism in this. There's some DBT in this. There's some Lego in this. Whatever works for the individual tends to be the tools that we use. I hope you've enjoyed that. I hope it's been useful and I hope that it's made sense. I, Of course, I would say that because I'm autistic. So if there's anything else that you would like to know, please do get in touch with me. My contact details are at the side. I love to talk about this stuff. Of course I do, because I have ADHD. Thank you so much for your time. And I really, really hope to speak to you all soon. Thanks a lot.